Yep, 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 yep. Mm-hmm. Ah, fire bad. Yep, 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 yep. Smoke good. Bow, 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 all right, all bow, right. Bow, stop bow. it. Stop it. Stop it. There's no reason. Feed my no, Frankenstein. Stop it. That's enough. Stop it. Because I'm 18. Uh, okay, here we go. Ready? Yeah, let's do it. Welcome to Butcher Block Horror Podcast, where we exhume horror movies from the past and cut into what makes them so delectable. I'm Kane. I am the monster. And I am the scientist. Dr. Frankenstein. And tonight, we're throwing Frankenstein onto the slab. Frankenstein! Ah! It is your host. <laughs> Wait, what? I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. And so, it might tantalize if you. If any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now's your chance to... Quiver and run. Well... We warned you. Thrill me, chill me, If you enjoy me. the taste of these feasts of fright, then make sure you review us wherever you consume your podcasts. If you do the YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and click the bell. If you'd like to support the show directly, go to wegiveybrainworms.com. There is a Patreon link as well as a link to our funky, fresh Discord server. Yep. Hibber, hibber. Yep. Frankenstein. We watched it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We watched the shit out of that shit, and it was fun. All right. Well, why don't you tell us about it, J.D.? I'm gonna. Frankenstein was released November 21st of 1931 in the good old USA with a runtime of 71 minutes and a very strange budget number, $262,007. That's really specific. Right. Do you think the $7 was for that handful of flowers that was thrown in the water? It might have been, or maybe it had to go on the little girl's piggy bank as she took a bath. Yeah. Or it was just lunch. <laughs> it was just lunch. It was lunch, though, for the entire cast and crew. Yeah, <laughs> it was 1931. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it had a box office return of $12 million, so Frank did all right. Yeah. Frankenstein was directed by James Whale, who entered existence in England July 22nd, 1889, and sadly punched his ticket on May 29th of 1957. He had a series of strokes near the end of his life that really kind of put him in a bad place, and he actually ended up committing suicide. Oh, okay. damn. Just a very sad ending for James Whale. But his legacy has lived on. Whale is best remembered for a handful of very classic horror films, beginning with Frankenstein in 31, followed by The Old Dark House in 1932, then The Invisible Man in 33, and The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935. That's one of my personal favorites. The producer of Frankenstein was Carl Lamelli Jr. Lamelli was a well-known film producer of his time and the son of Carl Lamelli, who actually founded Universal Studios April 30th of 1912. Junior, though, was the head of production over there at Universal from 1928 through roughly 1936. Do you know where Julius Lamel is from? I dropped the ball on that. Give us some geography. He's from Chicago, you piece of shit. Oh, shit. You silly goose. How do I forget? Seriously, a man of my own people. So let's see here, on to the plot of Frankenstein. The film begins with Edward Van Sloan, that's what Kane was riffing off of earlier, Edward popping out hands. from behind a curtain to break the fourth wall. And creep me the fuck out. And creep us all the fuck out to deliver a brief word of caution, some shit about playing God. I feel like they did that shit a lot back then. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like the fourth wall was a thing. That was like a popular thing that... that uh, yeah, back when movies were kind of figuring out how they were different from stage theater. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta get your audience to brace itself, I guess, if it's 1931, because they don't realize they're about to get hit yeah. with some Frankenstein's monster. Like that story about how people saw a train on screen the first time and freaked the fuck out. 
Is that because people are genuinely just dumb? That's what it seems like, because people still clap after movies. Or is it the situation where any technology sufficiently beyond what a person understands is magic? I mean, assuming that story is true, because it might just be like a pop cultural myth. Right. I hope it's a myth. Then probably that, that it was just they had never seen this new technology before. And they were just like, what the fuck? Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, Vance Sloan also plays Dr. Waldman. You mean Waldman, as pronounced in the film. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> there was no consistent accent. The movie didn't care that it was set in Germany. Yeah, the movie didn't give a shit. Yeah, no. So yeah, Vance Sloan, though, was giving us this cautionary word. Some shit about playing God and the mysteries of creation, both in life and death. Sure. From there... We visit a village sky high in the Bavarian Alps. Mm, I want a Bavarian pretzel right now. Yeah, or a Toblerone. Oh, shit. Joe, my God. How did you know that I wanted that? <laughs> I would just like some strudels. I'd frost your strudel. Yeah, or some like sauerkraut and sausage. That'd be all right. I just want the sausage part. I don't want the sauerkraut. I like sauerkraut. Yeah, I think you misunderstood where I was going with that. Oh, you were talking about dick. Okay, sure. <laughs> I thought we were talking about German food items that we would like to eat. We started off that way. We started off that way. We were talking about German food items. And then right there at the end, I was like, yeah, you know, I like sauerkraut, but I want to talk about just getting the sausage. going to make a dick joke. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah, a pearly white lasso of semen. Whoa! No! No! no, no. JD, this is a family show, and that's exactly Bullshit! <laughs> so, we're in the Bavaria Mountains, there's, like, a funeral happening, people are real fucking sad. There's pretzels, and No one is eating sausages. pretzels, or sausage. Whatever. They are drinking foamy mugs of beer, though. Are they at the funeral? Yes. No. Well, they do later at the party. They do later. But yeah, well, I thought you were talking about the plot of the movie. No, I'm just talking about whatever dumb shit pops into my head at any given moment. Oh, that's great. So, in these Bavarian Alps is where we meet Henry Frankenstein. Hank Frank, as I like to call him. Which is really a bummer. What's a bummer? That he's Henry Frankenstein. Oh, because right, Henry right. is such a shitty replacement for Victor Frankenstein. That's true. I like Victor. Yeah, that was a weird choice that the movie made. Like, to right? whose benefit? Maybe because they just wanted to be like, that's Hank Frank. <laughs> I mean, you have to think, like, back in the 1930s or whatever, Guy was a really popular first name to give someone. Yeah. So, Did you say who uh, played Henry Frankenstein? Oh, Colin Clive. Thank you. And then we meet his assistant, Fritz who was played by Dwight Fry. Dwight Fry. What a hell of a name. Yep, his name was not Igor. And the two are up to some shit, let me tell you. Yeah. They're ghouls. They really are. They're piecing together various bits of freshly dead and buried. They're resurrection men. <laughs> they are. Uh, yes, erection. Whoa, no, I said resurrection. And freshly hanged criminals. Hashtag body positive. Hashtag dirty mirror. <laughs> Nothing like a little late night composite corpse work, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the 1930s. You couldn't do that shit during the day. You got to make friends, though, right? Isn't that what it's all about if we're talking about the end of the day? I mean, it, so here's the thing. Back in those days, people always had wakes, right? Sure. It's like the body would lay in state for a certain amount of time. Oh, yeah. That shit could be, be getting funky. In the parlor. <laughs> While everybody gets hammered. We getting drunk while you funk. Yeah, while everybody comes and visits and talks about that time that you did some shit that happened and stuff. And then the, you start to stink enough, they, they you know, close the lid. Where is this going? It's not going anywhere. <laughs> what I'm saying, though, is, is the corpse wouldn't be in very good fucking condition. Mm. Because they didn't bury them fresh. Like, they didn't bury them the next day. They buried them... Like a week later. Yeah. Like, they lie in state for, like, a certain amount of time. And I'm confident the embalming methods of that era might not, not have been what they are yeah. today. Anyway, Henry and Fritz, they're just trying to inject some life into a, a composite corpse through a system of electrical devices. His creation needs a brain. If hashtag I only foreshadowing. Had a brain. Wait, are you gonna hashtag this entire goddamn episode? No, no, that was the last one, I promise. I was just trying to arouse anger. In me? And it worked. Yeah, it did. 
All I know is is that a special little goblin is going to be visiting your front porch soon. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to send it up through my toilet again. Is Kane like the guy from the X-Files that comes up through your sewer grate and like munches your butt? No. Oh, somebody's been eating it. It's the Christmas goblin. All right. (laughs) Just watery shit all over your doorstep. Ah, that's terrible. You got to eat better, man. Yeah, you really do. I am not the Christmas goblin. All right. I don't think that's true. You got to believe, guys. You got to believe. <laughs> I think you need to change your diet so your stools are a little more solid. <laughs> yeah, up your fiber intake. My stools are fine. My stools are fine. The Christmas goblin is the one that sprays out watery shits, all right? <laughs> With the loose and runny balls. Kane, are you are you embarrassed of your runny stools? <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, he's starting a movement, Joe. Let's catch fire. Oh, did you make a pun? Runny shit positivity? What's going on here? (laughs) What the fuck? Hashtag. Ah, you know, no more hashtags. That's fucking stop it. That's it. That was the conclusion of my... So, all right, yeah, so Fritz... I'm going for it. Yeah. They're at a nearby school, and we meet Hank's former professor, Dr. Voldman. That was played by Van Sloan. Uh Uh-huh. He's showing his class the difference between a so-called normal brain and that of a criminal's brain. Mm. I don't think he really knew the difference. No, that's not good (laughs) science. And I don't see how he, yeah, because, and really like the two of you, you're, I consider you both criminals because you stole my heart. Smooth criminals. Ow! Anyway, I, I'm so sorry that had just happened, everybody. Yeah, um, yeah, you did it again. Forgive us and remember to follow and like our shit. <laughs> anyway, Henry sends Fritz to school because he's a melon. Oh wait, never mind. No, he sends Fritz to school to steal a healthy brain, but Fritz and his creamy little butterfingers they malfunction. <laughs> I mean, that's not completely true. All right, Fritz is a little fucking nervous. He's not particularly put together well for being a sneak thief. You know what I mean? Yeah. He walks with a cane. All right? a he's limp. got a hunchback. Yeah, he's he's not qualified for theft. He's not a stealthy thief, no. you know? So he gets in there, there's a loud noise, it startles him, and he drops the normal brain. Yeah, so then he, he grabs the bad brains. Don't care what they may say, we got nice. that attitude. Hell yeah. Nice. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah. We got that PMA, though. Anyway, he grabs the bad brain, and uh, I'm just learning comedy, by the way. Can I be excused? Yeah, of course. Good night. No, you can't, Joe. You sit your ass right there. Anyway, back to the talking picture. Yep. We meet Henry's fiance, Elizabeth. Rawr. <laughs> rawr, rawr. <laughs> Do I get to tell everyone who played Elizabeth, or are you just going to mosey on along? I don't give a shit. Let's hear it. Yes, May Clark. May Clark. Okay. And their friend, Victor. So here's the thing. In the actual in the book, Mary Shelley's book, mm-hmm. Victor Frankenstein yep. has a dear friend named Henry. Uh-huh. Why did they flip the names? They fucked it up. That's I all. don't know, man. I really don't. Like they, they did make a lot of just very arbitrary changes to the source material to no one's benefit. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's real weird. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. But anyway, Elizabeth and Victor, uh, they're concerned for some of Henry's activity and seclusion. Yeah. It's been like four months since either of them have seen him. Yeah, he's been hanging out with Fritz a little too much. And Fritz is kind of a scumbag, so I could understand them being concerned. Yeah. yeah. Especially if they know. Like, if they know, they're like, ooh, man, he's been around Fritz a lot. What's going on here? Yeah, that guy's weird. Yeah, we need to wash his body. <laughs> he smells like soup all the time. Oh, yeah, like a meaty soup, like a yeah. Italian wedding or something like that. Minestrone, good. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so they turn to Dr. Waldman for advice. And every other time I say this name, I'm going to use uh, either a V or a W just to confuse everyone. Waldman... He lets on about Henry's desire to recreate life through experiments. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. In fear of Henry's well-being, the trio head to the laboratory right in the nick of time as Henry is uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, t- so to speak. So come on up to the lab yep. and see what's on the slab. Hell yeah. I see you shiver 
with Anne Tissa. Passion. No, nope, you ruined it. Oh. Keep keep All going. Right, sorry. Just sorry. Help. You're gonna let it hang. Yeah, you know what? That's not bad advice. Nice. What? So in the midst of the final um, preparations, the lifeless body composite lay on an operating table. Through the raging storm, Henry welcomes in Elizabeth, Victor, and Dr. Waldman. And the thunder rolls. Dun, 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 da, 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 da. Wow. <laughs> Don't ever fucking reference Garth Brooks in my presence. Was that Garth Brooks? <laughs> that was. Yeah. That's Dude, exactly I was so was. small like the last time I heard that song. <laughs> God damn it, King. <laughs> uh, Didn't that guy God. wear like horrible shirts? Yeah, he did. Wasn't that his thing? Yeah. I mean, it was the late 80s through the mid 1990s. Pretty much everyone was wearing some kind of terrible shirt. Some version of a terrible shirt. Yeah. Yeah, fuchsia and teal track suits. Those were the worst. Mm hmm. So the trio uh, are now spectators as Henry and Fritz raise Kiss the hard. operating table. Uh, yes, and they, uh, man, you just made my brain uh, <laughs> start punching on the, the menges and the walls of my skull. Thinking about those guys like making out on top of the monster. Just on top just of the monster, really yeah. Just like grabbing ass and just it really getting did in things there. to me. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, we're going to talk Twitter about baby. grabbing ass later. I got a moment. <laughs> anyway, so they're raising this operating table toward a large opening at the tip of the tower, just the tip. <laughs> it is where Frankenstein's monster is born, officially. Despite Frank's rough exterior, he seems to be a bit of a, a softy up front, though. Innocent and childlike. As the creature comes to be, uh, it, it see excuse me. What's going on here? We can just talk about making out some more if you want. God damn it. Yeah, my brain still rattled. <sighs> so as the creature comes to its feet, Henry begins speaking to him, inviting it to have a, a seat. Well, it kind of like tours the little laboratory first. It, uh, it was hard to follow. <laughs> Henry then opens a, a giant window thingy, allowing some sunlight in. It's less of that. He invites him into the room and then convinces the creature to sit down. Right, 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 right. And he's basically sh trying to show Dr. Waldman Waldman that the creature isn't inherently evil because there's this whole time where Dr. Waldman and Dr. Frankenstein are conversing and Frankenstein's being kind of a smug bitch. Right, right, right. And he's like, well, pff, you should be impressed. The brain was stolen from your university. And then Waldman's like, oh, that brain? That brain that was, was a fucked Abby up Normals. brain. <laughs> it was yeah. Abby Normals brain, yeah. And so Dr. Faldman's like, this thing is inherently going to be evil. The only thing that criminal brain knew was murder and mayhem, right? Yep. So that's why Frankenstein is inviting the creature right. to come out and sit down. And he's trying to show Waldman that the creature isn't inherently evil. And he kind of does have a sweet moment where he reaches up to, he toward the light. Yeah, I mean, if people didn't fuck with the monster, he would probably have been... People like Fritz? Yeah. Like when Fritz fucking waddles in with a huge torch and scares the <laughs> shit out yeah. of him. That's the thing is, is when Fritz walks into the room mm -hmm. with the torch, there's an immediate reaction. Frankenstein's monster immediately <laughs> freaks the fuck out. Right. Yeah, I mean, if somebody waved a torch at me, I'd freak the fuck out too. I'd be like, Not like kicking that. some fucking balls. <laughs> but Fritz is like, oh, he doesn't like this. I'm going to do it more. Yeah, fucking the monster has his, uh, a panic attack, basically, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that never goes well for anyone. It's true. Anyway, Henry and Waldman Waldman. Waldman Waldman. <laughs> yeah, they mistake the monster's fright for rage, and unfortunately so. And they have the monster chained to a dungeon wall. Which, honestly, it's, it's like... That's no way to treat a monster. All of those actions made the creature a monster. Yeah, yeah. It started off as a creature, somewhat human, made up of human parts. And in the course of the first day of its life, it gets fucking tortured. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what do you do? So to make matters worse, Dick Bag Fritz begins to antagonize the monster even more, again, with a torch. And a whip. Yeah, and a whip. What a bad thing to do. Anyway, he gets himself choked out with a chain. And strung up. <laughs> and strung the fuck mm -hmm. up. That's right. Waldman, Waldman, and Henry have him locked away and plot to destroy him. But Fritz had it coming. 
I did not feel bad for Fritz at all. Hmm. So real quick, I needed to interject this, right? The original casting for Frankenstein was supposed to be Bella Lugosi. Oh, okay. And the original director and pretty much everyone involved with the film ended up getting fired and replaced. But the original plan was that it was just going to be a creature full of murder and viciousness. Even when they switched to Boris Karloff and James Whale, they still did not want people to identify or empathize with the monster. They just wanted it to be scary and terrifying. But they failed because I sympathized with the fucking monster from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Throughout the whole film, I sympathized with the monster. (laughs) I've loved Frankenstein ever since I was a little kid. I don't see how anybody could be angry at Frank. Yeah. So Fritz gets killed, Dr. Waldman Waldman and Henry Frankenstein uh, concoct that plan where Waldman Waldman is going to inject it, you know, inject the monster. Yeah, Henry cooks up a, a lethal injection and a plan to release the monster and inject him as he attacks. Yep. And the plan goes off without a hitch as the monster once again lays lifeless. Henry is now exhausted. He collapses, and he gets ushered home by his father and um, his fiancée, Elizabeth. Henry is still freaking out about his creation, and rightfully so. But Waldman reassures him that everything will be taken care of. Dun, dun, dun! Little did he know. Mm. (laughs) Anyway, Henry is now at home, and he's recovered and preparing. Well, let's real quick, because we didn't get to talk about Lionel Belmore who played the Burgomaster. Burgomaster, Meister, Burger. And Frederick Kerr, who played Baron Frankenstein. There's like this weird interaction between Elizabeth and Victor going and Mm -hmm. seeing Henry's dad, which seemed like a real weird play. (laughs) Yeah, that guy was the most. Yeah. And then there's like this weird interaction between the Burgomaster. Does anyone know what a Burgomaster is? Yeah, it's like a like a lord, like the lord of the, the land, but it's, you know, German. No, it's like the master of the town. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You said it was a lord. Closer to like the mayor than... Okay, so it's like the mayor. Yeah. He shakes hands and kisses babies. Maybe he shakes babies and kisses hands. That's more like it. It's a weird time. Mm. Zing. <laughs> Anyway, there's like this... I'm bored. Of course you... Joe, how about we do this? You just sit here quietly, Uh and when we need you to tell us about the cinema choreographer and the writer, then you speak up. But until then, just shut your fucking mouth. (laughs) I wish I could get my butt closer to the microphone so it can have a word. It's on a long cord. You can move the microphone to your butt. That's true, but it's on a a stand, and and that stand has, you know, like, special abilities. (laughs) What the fuck? I'm afraid to take it off the stand. But if you want to mic your butt, you can just, it's fine. You can I know, just... but it's its too late. I, I already farted. It's fine. <laughs> oh, God. God. <laughs> so Henry is, he's now at home and he's recovered. He's preparing to make another huge mistake. He and Elizabeth <laughs> will web soon. <laughs> Cut to Waldman Waldman, who's about to examine the monster and uh, possibly perform some experiments of his own just as waldman is about to get weird the monster jd is so excited to say he's about to get a handful of ass but then he fucking reaches up and strangles the fucking piss out of waldman 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 Waldman. Waldman. (laughs) so he goes down the monster is now on the lamb, wandering aimlessly. Who's going down? What? Waldman, Waldman. He's okay. dead. He's <laughs> Waldman. He's Waldman, let, Waldman. He's let the loose this mortal coil. Yeah, he is expired. Let's mm-hmm. just go with that. Sure. He is an ex-doctor. <laughs> yeah, no and longer. And an ex-person, really. <laughs> Fired from life. <laughs> you can't fire me, I quit. That's right. That doctor is no more. Deceased. <laughs> the monster is now on the lamb, wandering aimlessly through the landscape. Bah. <laughs> Fuck. Until he meets a young girl named Maria. Mm-hmm. Played by Marilyn Harris. Yes, Marilyn Harris. What a sweet child. And there was a story that I read about how she wanted to take a car ride along with Boris Karloff in the Frankenstein monster costume. Hmm. Yeah, she was a fearless kid. 
I feel like I've heard stories about Boris Karloff being just a really sweet dude. Yeah, I think he had a, a pretty good temperament. He had a lot of back issues. The scene where he carries Henry Frankenstein up that big old staircase near the end of the film uh, supposedly blew out some discs in his back and apparently needed uh, some back surgeries as a result. It should have bent his knees. Yeah, when you lift anything, people, when you lift anything, bend your knees, use yeah. your legs. Anyway... The monster and Maria, they make fast friends, and she's like, hey, you want to play a game? They're on a similar intellectual level, it seems. The child is probably smarter, but they're vibing. You could just tell. It's like Bumble BFF friends or whatever you call that shit. And she's like, let's toss flowers into the lake. And he's like, Arr. <laughs> He really seems to love it, though. He's genuinely fucking into it. Maybe a little too much so, though, because... The second they run out of flowers, he decides to toss Maria into the lake, and she was the most non-buoyant human being who's ever lived. The second <laughs> she broke the surface tension, she just sunk straight to the bottom. Yeah, very close to the shore, too. The water didn't look as deep as all that. Yeah, and it didn't even seem like it was moving violently. It wasn't like it was like a river and there was some <gasps> current. I figured it that... out. I figured it out. Okay. Please share. All right, so... It was very shallow there. Uh -huh. She and cracked her shit on exactly. a rock. Exactly, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Because he did chuck her pretty hard. Yeah, he chucks her. But here's the thing. We have a lot of passages in our body like that would maybe possibly raise us to back to the surface. We didn't see her. Well, I mean, they leave the scene. I want to read too much into this, though. It was visually very funny. It was very funny. So anyway, um, she disappears, assumed to be drowned, and uh, Frankenstein's monster runs off again. Fuck you! Now all the preparations for the big wedding day are now set. And, uh, you know, well, actually, Wedding Crashers was actually a, a sequel to Frankenstein. <sighs> Henry and Elizabeth, they're all happy as can be, but they can't tie the knot until their old friend, Waldman Waldman, arrives. Victor rushes in, however, Spoiler delivering... Alert. <laughs> yeah it was not a nice day for a white wedding it was not and so he delivers horrid news everyone instantly knows who's at fault it's the big man oh i was gonna say capitalism mm -hmm. well that first of course but uh after capitalism the monster and we find elizabeth alone in a room where uh the monster pays her a visit absolutely scaring the shit out of her as well <laughs> she screams and that alerts everyone in search of the monster to uh, run toward the room. And when they arrive, they find Elizabeth passed out on the ground. But the monster has escaped yet again. Now we have Maria's father showing up, carrying her waterlogged corpse. How did he know that she was murdered, though? That's the real question. We and didn't the, know. Well, that's just it. No, he would have known because her melon was, was cracked open. But she could have fallen into the water herself. It doesn't seem likely. So anyway, she's super dead, and he claims that she had been murdered, so he and a mob of angry villagers, the village people, they perform a search party with intent to whoop the monster's ass. During this relentless search, Henry is encountered by his creation. The set for that part was amazing, remember? Mm -hmm. You could see the brush strokes of the painted sky and the canvas. Yeah, I mean, again, transferring very old movies to modern high definition can really fuck them sometimes. Right? Oh, absolutely. So yeah, Henry ends up getting um, knocked the fuck out. <laughs> he gets clubbed with a fist. <laughs> yeah, he really does. I think and that's the monster, just punching. He takes him away up to the top of an old grain mill. And so this is that scene I was talking about where Boris Karlov actually blows his back out. And also, I'd like to mention, we're two for two on being some type of mill as a part of the set of an old horror film. It's true. Let's see. What else does JD have in store for us? Anyway. Uh, the some, end of the movie, I assume. Yeah. Some peasants hear Henry's bitching and moaning, and so they rush to his aid, and the monster goes to fling Henry to the ground. But uh, his life is saved by the veins of the windmill. One of the veins sort of like breaks his fall and he looks like a, a ridiculous fake doll. <laughs> it's an incredible moment. Yeah, like a sack of flour in the shape of a person maybe. Yeah, yeah. So then the, the village people decide to bring him to the YMCA. Uh, I've heard rumor that it's fun to stay there. I've heard that too. It is fun to stay there. They've got everything. 
you can have a good meal. It's, it's great. So they set this windmill on fire, and uh, the angry monster is trapped inside. The film then concludes with a toast made by Henry's father to his future grandchild. The end. Yay! Yay! Yay. <laughs> Oh All right, well, the score was done by Bernard Kahn. Mm. The Kahn man. It was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. Hell yeah, yeah it was good. Was it served the movie. Bitchin'. Joe, real quick, why don't you tell us about the cinemagoragographer and the writer? Uh, no. What if we say pretty please with, uh, what's your favorite uh, sweet flavor that we could put on top? I don't know. Whatever. I'll just do it. It's fine. Okay. Quit being a baby. <laughs> It's not going to be real quick, though, because there's actually like a lot of I've, I've tried to truncate it as best I can. But there's okay. a lot of shit to talk about with writing and cinematography. All right. Well, do it. All right. We're going to go three layers deep here in terms of the, the writing of this movie. OK, because it was based on a play like a stage play by Peggy Webling, a British playwright, novelist, and poet. She only had one other film credit, a movie called Boundary House from 1918, which could have been a horror movie. The only information I could find about it was uh, a miser forces a girl to marry him and poses his dead wife. Weird. But she did a lot of things in the like the 1910s and 1920s in terms of writing and and stage writing and shit. The play was inspired by the novel Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley, which is considered one of the first examples of science fiction. And it was written as the result of a challenge between Mary Shelley and two other writers who were snowed in to write ghost stories. Mary Shelley, famous novelist of the Gothic era. All of that inspired the screenplay for this film. It's a lot. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of sandwich. <laughs> well, let's all take a bite. Yeah. The screenplay was written by John L. Balderstone, which is an amazing name to have. John Luke Picard? No. John L. Balderstone, who was an American playwright, journalist, and screenwriter, who, as a foreign news correspondent, covered the opening of the Tomb of King Tut in Egypt. Did he mysteriously die after that? No, he had a long career in journalism and, and screenwriting. Oh. He did not mysteriously die. You know why he didn't mysteriously die? Because curses aren't real? That's correct. Curses yeah. are not real. I've heard that the most logical explanation for that kind of myth mold spores. is yeah, mold inside the tomb that people would then inhale and then die. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he was a journalist for a long time and then his newspaper folded, at which point he became a full time screenwriter. He wrote shit like a lot of universal monster stuff, shit like Dracula, the mummy, which may or may not have been inspired by. The opening of King Tut's tomb, The Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula's Daughter, and obviously this movie. Hell yeah. And that's all I've got to say about writing, but I can talk about a cinematographer. Excellent. Cinematography was done by Arthur Edison, who is a legend in the field of cinematography and was considered a, a pioneer in the craft. He started out as a photographer and joined the film business in 1911 at Eclair Studios, which sounds delicious. Ooh, Eclair's. Cream filled. Yeah. My favorite. I prefer Boston cream pies. All right, isn't that your favorite pastry, Boston cream pie? Yep. Yeah. Do you like Boston baked beans? I do not. I don't like baked beans either. Yeah. I'm a key lime pie guy. Key lime pie rules. Yeah. I like key lime pie. What about a Boston cream pie filled with baked beans? Why would anyone do that? It's, like, why? How come they don't make a donut filled with the uh, um, key lime stuff? I just want to let do. you know that tomorrow. Those, those exist. I'm going to well, how come I haven't get up one? early and I'm going to go buy a Boston cream pie mm -hmm. and I'm going to eat all of it by myself. Not all share in with one us. Sitting, all in one sitting. What if I look at you with my uh, puppy dog eyes? Then your puppy dog eyes will bear witness to the <laughs> atrocity that is me consuming an entire Boston cream pie by myself. Um, I'm actually more interested in talking about dessert than talking about this movie, but I am going to keep talking about this movie. Oh, well, yeah, go ahead. We appreciate it. Yeah. But yeah, he worked as a photographer at Eclair Studios and also was an extra in their films. <laughs> that entire rant 
was born from <laughs> the name of a studio. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh-huh. That's, <laughs> that's how that's we I do. do. <laughs> and yeah, he worked his way up to cinematography in 1914 and began a legendary four-decade career. This guy is like one of the legends of filmmaking. Damn. And I'm excited to talk about him. He had a very like modern sort of photorealistic style that a lot of film nerds have very strong opinions about how it influenced the direction of filmmaking down the road. Hmm. Uh, he worked on shit like Casablanca, The Maltese Falcon, All Quiet on the Western Front, all classic films. Oh, yeah. Girls Gone Wild, not the one you're thinking of. Ooh. <laughs> Many boxes of Kleenex later. Although it would have been funnier if this very distinguished filmmaker was working on Girls Gone Wild. <laughs> How amazing would those Girls Gone Wild videos have been? Oh my God, yeah. The, the shots would have been perfectly framed up. They're in black and white. They're like, ooh, look at the ankles on that one. <laughs> the lighting is just, yeah, is just so. Would have been great. I saw her wrist. Oh, you're talking about like 1930s Girls Gone Wild. I yes. Guess. Yeah. That's, that's that my been, joke. That would have been very good. He was nominated for three Oscars, was one of the first people to experiment with widescreen, apparently, way back in 1930. Oh, wow. Yeah, before it really like became the standard. Unfortunately, he only has four horror credits. I'm kind of surprised that Kane didn't yell at me when I referenced other non-horror movies. Whatever. That's okay. You're talking about a genius. Yeah. Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, The Old Dark House starring Lon Chaney, and a film called The Gorilla, which I don't know anything about, but apparently the back of the box summary is an ape is suspected of committing a series of murders. Hmm. And that's all IMDb has to say about it. Yeah. Sounds really good. Yeah. And yeah, unfortunately, after his legendary ass career in game changing camera work he passed in 1970 but he was great and then there was an uncredited cinematographer according to the imdb page for this movie named paul ivano who i'm not going to talk as much about but he had he also had a very long career in film and uh, he worked on a movie called frozen ghost which has a funny name (laughs) that is kind of a funny name made me laugh i think the funniest name the cinema gorgographer had worked on Mm-hmm. is The Cock-Eyed World. That is pretty good. Nice. The One-Eyed Snake. All right, is that all you got, Joe? Yeah, I'm, I'm done talking. All about. right, cool. JD, tell us about the special effects. You got it, baby girl. Special effects. We got three people uncredited for uh, prop creation, Frank, Oscar, and Paul Dallins. The Dallins Brothers 3... They were responsible for a lot of the cool props you see in the background and different things throughout the mansion and the castle or whatever you want to call it. Then we have the infamous John P. Fulton, born November 4th of 1902, died July 5th of 1966. And Fulton has hella special effects credits, 76 in total. He also has 253 visual effects credits. Jam-packed with countless horror films. Just name a few. We've got Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Old Dark House. There's just an ocean of them. Like, I didn't bother to list them all. It's for the best. So I would just go ahead and encourage our listeners to check out. I just typed in original Frankenstein horror makeup in YouTube And I got to watch some really cool tutorials on how they were able to, the whole process of them dressing Boris Karloff with the makeup. And they kind of started it off with like the rubber headpiece and just started building it all really brilliantly. I'd rather watch them undressing Boris Karloff, if you know what I mean. Nice. Uh, Nice. But they, uh, they get in a decent amount of detail. Obviously there is no live footage or anything like that. It's all just... A series of still frames, but it shows the progression. It's pretty awesome. Sure. But yeah, they just build it up with like a lot of latex material and adhesives and things like that. So, and a a bit of makeup. This movie used more CGI than I expected. (laughs) (laughs) You fucking tool. (laughs) You broke my brain again. All right. Are we we done here? (laughs) I mean, I can say more dumb shit if you want. No, no, we're good. Let's go ahead and talk about our personal experience with the film. Joe, what? start us off. Fucking go. Yeah, I remember, and and if the two of you remember this, back me up, because it's like a vague memory 
of the Universal Studio monsters having a big comeback in the 90s, especially like around Halloween. There was a lot of merchandise and shit tied to those characters. I don't ever remember a time when the Universal monsters weren't first and foremost in the eye of Halloween. Okay. Like ever. No, I see what you're saying, though, Joe, because every decade they do seem to, at some point, throw it all out there again, you know, and then it's not that it's ever forgotten. I feel like that's totally spot on. They're always there and they're always kind of at the forefront. If you go to the Halloween store or the uh, Spirit of Halloween or Mm -hmm. Party City around that time, it's like you're always going to see those classic masks and props and things like that. But I feel like once a decade, though, because I remember like... In the 80s and the 90s, like a series of toys being released. Yeah. You know, having to do with like the Universal Monsters. and Yeah, and like candy and, and shit packaged with those characters. And again, I'm like digging back into my dumb child brain memory. So like I could be out of whack, but. Which is being worked through by your dumb adult brain. Sure, so. sure. Does Count Chocula and Frankenberry sort of qualify? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, I would like to eat some Count Chocula right now. Does that count? Yeah. Yeah, sure it does. Is that all of your personal experience? Uh, no, Just... no, I had more. Yeah, let's let's do that. Come on. <laughs> I remember those movies, specifically the Frankenstein, because that's what we're talking about right now, being on television around that time and watching it and thinking it was pretty cool. And then I kind of almost forgot about it until we started talking about it for this. And it brought back a lot of those nostalgic, because I've always been a weird goth nerd, even when I was a child and didn't know what those things meant. And so I was always like real, real enthusiastic about spooky shit. And so talking about doing research for and then watching this movie brought back a lot of those warm, fuzzy, like Halloween when I was a when I was a baby kind of feelings. Right. That's exciting. I'm really stoked that that happened. It's a shame that you are the Eeyore of this podcast. It's true. And you couldn't actually present that joy that childhood joy you know yeah. while we were talking about this you had to just keep saying i'm done here don't feel bad joe there's only one picture of me under the age of 10 with a smile on my face the rest sure. is all scowl and mostly i just do that to antagonize you specifically like <laughs> act like i don't want to be involved and right right i just right. i just do it to irritate but you. really we're the light of your life kind of yeah anyway <laughs> JD, tell us about what, how much you uh, want yeah. to make out. JD, of me. tell us Describe about your personal experience that with the film. Frankenstein gives me, yeah. Describe your favorite Sunday afternoon. Well, it would be a a Sunday afternoon in early October with uh, no, never mind. <laughs> Frankenstein. Yep. I love the Universal monsters. I have Hell a nice yeah. collection. I got some box sets. I got all that fun stuff. And my first impression. I saw Frankenstein when I was a really little kid, and I was desensitized by so many other more grotesque horror films that when, right. I, <laughs> when I saw it, I was just like, I think I remember like my grandma or whoever I watched it with at the time to be more, you know, I think they were referencing their memories of it. And then so when they saw my reaction to it, they're like, oh, wow, he's laughing. Look at him. He loves it. <laughs> but I had already watched, you know, Zombies tear people's throats out with their teeth so by the time you know frankenstein comes around it's just like okay right yeah there's still something like super magical about the black and white and i think that's what i'm really happy that the two of you were on board to talk about black and white horror films for this whole season because they're some of my favorite and they have this unique charm there's something to like the underlighting, and especially in this movie, and when we were talking about the cinematography, I feel like we didn't mention a whole lot of the the lighting effects. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the cinematography tricks were to underlight a lot of the shots, and especially in like a lot of the, the Universal horror films, especially like Bride of Frankenstein, you see it a ton. And I'm just like all over the place because I'm all excited. We're talking about Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, the movie itself, it's just a really cool story i've I've always enjoyed the idea of making something come to life that but that doesn't have to do with some spiritual thing or a religious thing like it was science it was just science they used science to resurrect a corpse Mm -hmm. that's why mary shelley is referred to as the godmother of science fiction yeah yeah she birthed science fiction with frankenstein 
or the modern Prometheus. And I, I love that they introduced that possibility, you know, at that time especially, mm-hmm. that something could just be science forward and created in a laboratory that is our equal. And uh, I, I just I was fascinated by that. And I think that was my biggest takeaway from Frankenstein. And I was also disappointed that they couldn't just find an arm that also had a hand still attached. They had to. Oh, my God. Like, we I talked know, about this. Yeah. We talked about this. All right. He probably could have. He probably could have found an arm with a hand attached. But the perfect arm didn't have the perfect hand. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But what made that perfect hand? Was it soft? Was it? Here's the thing is, is that he was digging up corpses. That's true. So there's a good chance that he found some beautiful arms. Right. That had rotten, gross hands. And he was like, well, I can't fucking use those. Chop, chop. So that's why. Mm-hmm. That's why, J.E. Yeah. That's why. Gotcha. All well, right. so with that said, perfect segue <laughs> to your uh, personal, um, whatever you want to call it, with the film. I saw all of the, the universal horror before most of the real horror. I guess not real horror, but the gory stuff. Sure. Sure. My dad like was really, really into The Wolfman. That was his favorite horror movie. I like The Wolfman too. So there was like, there's a certain nostalgia that's attached to watching any of these movies. It's actually been a long time. The I've watched. We'll we'll be covering it this season. Abbott and Costello meet the Wolfman. Abbott and Costello meet and fuck. That's not. They they don't meet and fuck anyone. No, it's spelled like meet, like M E A T. They meet no, him. Like, no, that's bam. not. Uh, uh, take it. That's not. Meet the Wolfman. Right. Yeah. They grind him. It's meet Frankenstein. Yeah, they grind up on him. Yeah. It's it's meet Frankenstein. He's like throwing his ass back, and Abbott and Costello are like grinding on him from both sides. You know? All right. All right. Well, anyway. I love these movies. I think they're a lot of fun. I had a good time watching it. It reminds me of being young. Aww. And that's it. That's, that's all that's I a got. Good parting thought. Anybody else have anything to add? No, I'm going to go watch. Good. Sons Fuck of you. you. What? If you watched Frankenstein, <laughs> let us know what you think. Frankenstein. You can find us at wegiveyoubrainworms.com. Dot com. Next week, speaking of the devil, we're covering the Wolfman. Once again, we warn you against forgetting to like and subscribe on YouTube. And click the bell. And follow us on Instagram. 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 I'm Googling how to say goodbye in German real quick. Why? This this movie didn't give a shit about German. Yeah. yeah but <laughs> we did not care. Everybody was faking a German accent and, and No, they weren't. That's the thing. Oh, nobody no. nobody used a German accent. The farmer tried to fake an Eastern European accent, kinda. Yeah, kinda. Well maybe that's what I'm hearing. I don't know. I don't know accents. They're all like UK accents. Or some in some cases just, just American accents. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Like little Maria had the Shirley Temple kind of twenties Hollywood accents. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like those those kind of things. There wasn't any type of cohesive No. The movie. <laughs>